Good morning. Happy to see you here today. A beautiful day the Lord has made. It's good to be rejoicing. Thank you to the worship team uh, for leading us in that worship of the Lord. And just uh, very happy to be here and uh, to celebrate uh, the Sabbath with you today. So today what I want to do is I would like to get into the Word and talk about a subject that I think is, is critical really to each one of us. And that is to have an intimacy with Almighty God. You know, when I look at what uh, it is, and if I could get, there it is, the, the scriptures, when you think about what eternal life is really about, when you think about what God is desiring and why he made you and me, he made us to have relationships with him and with each other, and ultimately bringing together into one all the people that he was choosing to join in as sons and daughters to be connected to him. And today what I want to do is I want to walk you through my journey as uh, looking at what it is and how uh, God worked in my life in the hope that as I learn to be a more faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, that I can at least share some things with you about how that journey looked for me. Now, this isn't everybody's journey. I'm going to give some points today, I think five points. They, you can add lots more points. This isn't an exhaustive list. This isn't the list, anything like that. But... When you talk about how do you build your relationship with God, it's so important that we remember that the Great Commission is to go make disciples. It's not just to get a statement, but to get a walk to say, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And so hopefully when you come here, you find that being expressed in that we desire to be the people of God who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we try to walk our ways being humble before him. And all of that should really spring from a relationship that we have with him. Because it's by the revelation of who God is that we are transformed. It's not about a discipline. It's not about a religious practice. It all comes from a relationship that produces these changes, that produces this transformation in our lives. And as a person who loved disciplines as a kid and rules and doing the right things, it, it, took me, it took me in good places, but it didn't take me where I needed to go. I searched the scriptures daily in them, hoping to find eternal life, but, they, but I needed to go all the way to Jesus, the one who actually could give me eternal life. And so that's what we're talking about today when we talk about the intimacy with the Almighty, to have a relationship with God where we are intimate with him. So first point, I clicked too many times there, but the first thing I want to talk to you about is listen. How do you listen? Turn with me over to the book of John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And notice with me in John chapter 10. It says this, in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, Most assuredly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now, this relationship of intimacy is like that of a shepherd and a sheep. He has his own fold. He has those that he tends to, that he watches over. When you receive the calling of Jesus Christ, you were called to know the shepherd. And he says that he is the good shepherd. Notice in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, uh, the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Don't you just love the possession he says there? I am known by my own. There's a relationship here of intimacy, of depth. It is not just an acquaintance. We don't just know about Jesus. We know Jesus. You know, this is one of the things of life. We we can think we know somebody, but we don't. We, We all know who Donald Trump is, but do we really know him? President Biden, we all know him, but do we really know him? I would dare say none of us in this room really know either of those two men. 
We can know about Abraham Lincoln, right? We can know about George Washington. Did we really know them? Do we ever have experience with them? And the thing is, sometimes we can read in the Bible about Jesus and know about Jesus, but do we really know him? And that's what we're talking about today. Intimacy goes beyond just knowing about. It goes to knowing the person and and having that experience. Well, how does that begin? It begins with conversation. It begins with listening. Now, in my life personally, this began for me as a teenager. I've told you the story many times about how God started to work in my life when I was 15 years old. And I spent the summer playing golf in the, the morning and the daytime and going home at night and reading my Bible. And it was the first time I can say that it, even though I'd been taught about Jesus my whole life, where it started to become intimate, something happened. The, the connection was I was listening to what he said really for the first time in my life, and it wasn't matching what I heard about him, what I was taught about him, And suddenly, the things of him and the things that I was understanding about his ways became very different. I remember reading about how the father had authority over the son, that Jesus called the father, my God. That didn't go with the the doctrinal teaching that I had as a kid, where the father, son, and Holy Spirit were equal in authority and power. And as I was listening to God, the revelation came No, the Father has authority over the Son, over the Spirit, over everything. In fact, all the work that God the Father is doing through Jesus is bringing about a reconciliation of all things to the Father. And when Jesus actually makes that reconciliation, it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, he himself will be subject to the Father. When he has delivered the kingdom to the Father, he himself... Now, I don't know about how it was for you when you read those verses, but to me it was like, what? Why didn't anybody tell me this? And I read there about the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and that Jesus was the first. I thought when everybody died, they were resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15 says, no, Jesus is the first. Nobody preceded Jesus. Even in the book of John, how many times did I read over, no one has ascended to heaven at any time except he who came down from heaven, he's ascended to heaven. How many times did I read that verse? How many times did I read over that verse? How many times did I not listen to what it said? And see, the intimacy that you get is just, will will you listen? And ultimately, this started for me just, just, just listening, just realizing I've been told a lot of things about you, God. It just hasn't been true. It's not what you said. Isn't it awful in our relationships, whether it's in a marriage relationship or a friendship, where we just don't take the time to listen to one another? How frustrating is that? Where you say, you're not, you're not really listening. You, you, you want to hear me say something you want to hear, but that's not what I'm communicating. You think I'm mad, I'm not mad. You think this, it's not true. And we have these communication issues all the time in our human relationships. And so, how do you develop an intimacy with the Lord? You have to begin by just listening to what he says. It is so fundamental and so critical to just listen to him. Now, what does that do? Next thing I want to talk about here is believe. Notice... uh, Well, actually, let me just quote it to you. So Romans 10, verse 17, a very familiar verse. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we talked about listening, and it is amazing how many times in the Bible. There are literally tens of times, scores of times in the Bible where God says, hear the word of the Lord. I love like when when you start reading through the prophets, the prophets say, hear the word of the Lord. Boom, right? They delivered what God is saying. Hear it. What does Jesus say? You hear this a lot in the New Testament. He who has an ear, let him hear. Why? Because listening 
can develop faith. See, if we're listening to hear what we want to hear, if we try to make God in our image and make God have our thoughts of what it should be, we're, well, that's not intimacy. That's creating a person in your own image. Unfortunately, we see this humanly a lot too. We try to make somebody who we want them to be rather than just seeing who they are. We try to fit them in the wrong places, you know. If you, if you were a coach of a football team, you wouldn't take Tom Brady and say, Tom, you know, you're, you're good, but we want you to play defensive back. I guarantee you, and I, and I just went over everybody's head who doesn't know football, but he would never, he would fail as a defensive back. Would you agree with that, Scott? But is he a great quarterback? The best. If you don't observe, if you don't listen, if you don't pay attention, you can be trying to fit a person to be something that they're, they were never designed to be. It is so amazing how frustrated sometimes we can get with each other because people aren't like us. And sometimes what happens is we take these same attitudes and we try to make God be like us. We try to make God in our image. We don't really want to hear what he has to say. But the only way to come to true faith is you have to listen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If the word doesn't prove it, don't espouse it. Don't say this is what God says. Don't say this is who God is. Don't say this is God's way if we haven't. Because intimacy is all about learning who he is and that listening. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. We must believe in him that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, the whole process is to say, I'm listening and now I'm believing. Isn't that really what we do in every relationship we have humanly as well? The only way to get to intimacy is you start at the beginning to say, let's spend time together where there's communication there's walking together a little bit, spending some time together. And what are you really doing when that you begin a relationship? Aren't you kind of listening for the ringing of truth, for the connection, for the things that, that you would want to be in a relationship that you could have intimacy in? You see, the, the, the point is that with God, it, it's not just a matter of knowing. It's not just a matter of listening to know. It's a matter of listening to believe. Do we hear his voice? See, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. They know me and I know my own. Because there's a connection that is deeper than just the about, the facts of Jesus. It's knowing who he is. And that happens because you believe what you hear. Now, all of us have had to have this challenge in life. Do we believe what we hear? I'll never forget the time where I was in my room and God was teaching me as a teenager to listen. And the listening brought me to this point, do I believe this? Because the challenge is, I was taught a certain number of things religiously. I was taught things about God that I, 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 I was now being challenged when I actually listened to what God said. And the question is, am I going to believe the traditions that I've been taught or am I going to believe what the Bible says? How fundamental is that to intimacy? Because if I had said, I'm just going to believe what I've always believed, it would have been rejecting what God had said to me and that I already listened to and I heard. Now, this is something that we all do. We all enter into listening to God with our own biases. In fact, if, 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 if I ever think that I'm, I'm hearing everything correctly, I just, I just slap myself and say, you're silly. You wake up. My prayer when I go in is just to say, God, let me hear your voice. Let me discover you in this. Let me hear the truth. You see, there is a heart. It's more than just reading. The Pharisees knew this very well. They knew the law. They knew the rules. But they didn't even know the one who, who made the rules when he walked in their midst. So what a shame that would be for us to be 
going through motions of saying we have a relationship with Jesus, but we don't even really know who he is. See, that's why intimacy with the Almighty is so very important. Our Father has spoken to us of himself through his Son, Jesus Christ, in these last days that we would know him. We become acquainted with him, and it is Jesus who ushers us into this relationship with the Father. And, and who is Jesus? He, as it says in Hebrews, is the express image of the Father. So that he can let us know. He says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't do anything ex- apart from my Father. But the invitation is to be intimate with him so that we don't do things apart from our Father. That we come to engage in the will of God day by day to the thing that we've been called to, to have a relationship with God to walk in his ways. And so, for me, it was a choice to say, okay, I see what it says, now will I believe him? I believe that if I had said no to that, the relationship would have stopped right there. I mean, how effective would it be if I'm getting to know a person, and if Stephanie and I were you know, becoming intimate when we were dating and and progressing toward marriage, if I just said, you know what, I really just don't believe you. I think it kind of stops the relationship right there, doesn't it? It just really kind of ends what's going on. Because do you want to be engaged with somebody that's saying unwilling to believe? God says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. If you don't believe me, how, how do we go forward in this? And ultimately, that was really what happened in the Garden of Eden when mankind went astray. It was a belief issue. Yes, it bore out in the disobedience to what God commanded, but it was a faith issue that caused it to happen because they believed what the serpent said instead of God. They believed the wrong one. So why is it important to be intimate with God? Because we want to flee the devil in all his ways, leaving it all behind, for the glorious things of God, and we must listen and we must believe. And that belief will then lead to trust. Turn with me over to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Very familiar verses, but I want to look at them in this context today of intimacy with the Almighty. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And anytime you see the Lord there in all caps, and you're going to see it about 6,000 times in the Old Testament, every time you see the four caps for uh, Lord or the three capitals, all capital letters for God, just know in your mind that is the name of God. It's a shame. You know, if you go grab a Spanish Bible, they put Jehovah in there. You look around at other languages that the Bible's translated, they all have the name of God there, except English. I don't understand it. We just don't, you know, and I want you to know that because there's an intimacy of relationship here too when you know somebody's name. If you never use a person's name, it feels less intimate, right? If I say, hello, Phil, right? It's better than just hello. Hello, Phil, right? It just, it speaks something louder than just the hellos. And so our Father in heaven has given us this understanding to trust in Yahweh, not another God, not Baal gods, not the gods of this world, not Estar, not anything else but the true living God. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Trust will reveal itself in the way you walk. It's what you do. So the first time I went through the Bible, I had, it was a challenge to me in regard to keeping God's commandments. And specifically, it was about the Sabbath day. But really, it wasn't just about the Sabbath day. It was the commandments as well. I had been taught my whole life to keep God's commandments. The question I had when I was in school, going to a private school was, hey, how come we say, let's do all the commandments except this one about keeping the Sabbath day holy. It's like, nobody's telling me because Jesus died, it's okay to murder. Nobody's saying the commandments to not commit adultery or now to covet or to steal are done away. Why is it that just this one? 
and as a kid, this was my question, and and and, it, and there was a, and it, I was told, well, it got changed. Oh, great, it got changed. I thought the change was in here, and as a kid, I accepted the change. Now, what was interesting is I got older and started asking the question. Then it was like, well, you don't have to keep any of the commandments. You don't? I thought we've been learning to keep the commandments. I know there's a verse in the Bible that says, if you love me, you should keep my commandments. I started hearing all these other voices. And here's the thing. You start listening to what God says and what other people say. You choose who you believe, and then who do you trust? Go with it. There's no... I can't even put into words right now the depth of the experience with God when I realized what was in his word was not what I was taught. It was not what I believed. It was not what I practiced. And I came to that moment and (laughs) I got to choose God. And I realized what that meant and the anger that I took from my father when I did it, and the anger I took from my friends, and how they said all the things that people say, you're a legalist, you think you have to do these things, that you're trying to earn salvation, none of that was true. But I was was convicted by God. What you're telling me is not the truth. And I have to choose what he said. I went through every verse in the New Testament looking for the proof that I didn't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. I went looking for it. And thank God he made me be honest enough with him to just listen to what he said. Because every place I went in the New Testament, I saw the disciples keeping it. I saw Jesus keeping it. I saw Jesus say, I'm Lord of it. I saw Jesus teaching people how to properly keep it. I saw Jesus saying what people should do. I saw that he was saying that the, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I saw that he said, pray that before the time of the tribulation that your flight need not be on the winter of the Sabbath. I'm like, wait a second. I thought the Sabbath was done away. He said, pray that your flight before the great tribulation is not on the Sabbath. That means the Sabbath would still be in existence before the great tribulation. Then well, where did all these ideas come from that all this was done away? And I was completely undone. I still feel how undone I was then right now talking to you about this because it just ripped me out. It made me so empty to say, why don't I listen? I just need to listen. I just want to listen. God, I have to trust you. If I don't begin with the trust of you, then who is my God? And I became completely undone. The product of my ministry, the product of of my life began there. I am an imperfect man. I know I still have biases. I know I don't listen to everything the way I should. And Lord, you know, I repent. I don't want that in me at all. I want the purity of truth. And my friends, that is where intimacy comes from. When you say, I'll trust you, I won't lean on my own understanding. I will acknowledge you in my ways, and I will walk accordingly. We try to make it so complex. You know why it gets so complex? Because our flesh is totally against that. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It is not subject to his law, neither indeed can be. If you try to do this as a list of rules to somehow prove your own righteousness, it's like filthy rags. What are you, what are you doing? But if you do it out of a love for God and an intimacy of relationship where you're saying, really all I want is you, God, then it's not about a rule. It's not about a regulation. It's about a way of living and thinking. If you just ask yourself the question, why did God bless and sanctify the seventh day after he made everything? Was God really tired? What, was he out of power? Was he zapped? What what, what was he thinking? And then Jesus said, hey, the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus tells you why he made it. What was he thinking about? He was thinking about you and me. What was he thinking about us? Guys, we need to stop what we would normally do 
and spend time with God. We need to stop. And all the people that can say, hey, you can spend time with God every day of the week, absolutely. I can worship God any day of the week, absolutely. Guys, Sunday's not off limits. Some people want to say Sabbath or Sunday. I never read anything about that anywhere. God never spoke that to me. Maybe you could show me where that is in the scripture, that somehow worshiping God on a Sunday is somehow a negative. I think if you worship God any day of the week, because what God shows us is that you could come and bring offerings to him. He commanded them every morning and every evening, every day. And then he says, and on the Sabbath, bring the morning and the evening, and then bring the Sabbath offerings in addition to that. He never says, don't come and worship me. Never. That, we're, these thinkings come from man arguments. And what happens is we start listening to God, and then we, we twist it another way. Because we're now anti what somebody else taught us, we then reject the truth that's plainly written. We come up with a whole new doctrine that's man-made as well. So you got to go back and listen. Believe what he says. Trust in it to take action on it. It never stops happening. Can you just say, well, hey, you know, I think, Stephanie, you and I, we've hit the pinnacle of intimacy. Let's just write out the rest of our lives never talking to each other again, never listening. How intimate would we be 10 years from now? No, I don't think so. You know, you can connect in relationships that you leave go for a while, but I wouldn't necessarily call them intimate because intimacy implies you know what's going on in the day-to-day, -day, in the walk, in the relationship. And that is part of the beauty of what builds when you start listening to someone, when you believe in them, and you trust what they say and start acting on it. Many of us have been injured in our lives because we started down this path with dads or moms or, or, or friends or, or people that maybe we even got married to. And it went very wrong because we, we sin. We fall short of God's glory. We break the trust so often. And that's why forgiveness is so essential. But the one who never sinned took on all sin that we might become the righteousness of God and be found in him to realize that every intimate relationship we have, whether it's with God or with each other, is built upon a foundation of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. It's that work that God did through him that saves all of our relationships. Because if I hurt Chris and Chris says, you really hurt me, David, I have to say, Chris, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And I, I know you would. That's why I chose you. That's why I chose you. I wasn't sure about Larry behind you, but I, I knew that if I asked you, you would give me the right answer. No, I love Larry. <laughs> I know you forgive me, Larry. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but you realize that trust, there's a dependency there. Do you ever think about the relationship? I rely on the fact that I'm going to need Stephanie to forgive me. I'm going to need Scott to forgive me. I'm going to need Chris to forgive me. Frankly, if you spend enough time with me, I'm going to need you to forgive me. I make mistakes all the time. I sin and fall short of the glory of God. I wish I didn't. But if I'm really being honest and, and, and being intimate, I sin. I think wrong things. I, I can be so selfish. And, and I know that. And God knows that. I trust that he'll forgive me. And in our relationships, we have to rely on each other to forgive one another. How will we ever become intimate and one with God if we can't learn the fundamental that every relationship we have must be built on a foundation of forgiveness? And as Christ has given to you, so you also must do. And you realize that when we fail to to forgive others, we're really just pushing away the forgiveness that God gives to us. We have to learn how to do this. And there's probably no better relationship for those of you who are married than in marriage. And if not, then in friendships, in family relationships. We all have the opportunities to walk and to understand what this is. So for me, the first action that I took was I said, I'm no longer cutting people's grass on the Sabbath. I had, I had my own little landscape business since I was like 10 years old. It's my first business that I started. 
I went to people and said, would you let me cut your grass for $5? And they did. People let me cut their grass. Well, when I got to 15, I couldn't do it anymore. Fortunately, God had blessed me with a paper route, and the paper was a daily delivery every day except Saturday. I was like, never was an issue. So I had my grass cutting business. In the fall, I had my leaf raking business. In the winter, I had my snow shoveling business. And my busiest day through all of that was always Saturdays, but no more. I wasn't going to do it anymore. I'm going to rest. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to learn about this. Now, I will tell you that the beginning of intimacy was awkward. It was awkward because I didn't necessarily understand why I was doing what I was doing. I knew he had said to rest. I knew he had said to remember. I knew he said to keep it holy. had no idea what that really meant. But that's kind of what relationship is, isn't it? You listen to understand, and the more you understand, the better you are at it. I used to be the worst husband, and I'm only now slightly above the worst husband, because I wasn't a very good listener. My wife had to really, like, put her hand up and say, would you stop bringing me flowers and jewelry? I'm not into things. But when we were in Greece, she tested me. She said, she, we were looking at all this jewelry, and she said, there's probably only one thing in this whole case that I even would wear that I even like. What is it? And I was like, oh, no. Oh. Oh, no. The pressure of intimacy. It's a little awkward. Do I know the answers? I gave her two choices, and it was one of them. So I was happy. So, yes, thank you. I did, I, I've listened. I, that, I, but I blew it for so many years. She's like, stop bringing me jewelry I will never wear. So the point is that I have grown with time, but in the relationship with God, it's the same thing. The more you do it, the more you understand it. A good understanding have all those who keep thy commandments. What does that mean? It's like you trust me enough to start into it. If you're going to go with me, David, I'm going to show you what it means. So when you go into the word, have the expectation. You might not always understand the whys, but if you start to practice and start to walk with God, just know that there's going to be more revelation that comes down the road. And sometimes, just like with the intimacy you develop with your child, sometimes that intimacy and trust that you build with a child, you start down a path of form that is really not about the form. It gets to the substance. You know, God started with the letter, but he was always intending the spirit. Always was trying to go to the spirit. You know, you, you tell your kids to not go in the street. You don't really mean that for the rest of their lives. You just mean to teach them that it's dangerous to go in the street unless you have the wisdom to understand and look for cars and be careful before you cross, right? So the, you give an absolute, but once the children understand, they understand, oh, I can do this. You know, the Pharisees, they were looking at the letter of the law, and they're like, Jesus, why are you healing on the Sabbath? You're breaking law. You're working. You're telling people to work. Your disciples are harvesting grain on the Sabbath to eat. Jesus is like, I think if you really understood who I am and my father that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't be judging people who are hungry, who are sick, who are hurting, who need healing. You wouldn't be looking at that. He said, don't you even realize the Levites work every, every Sabbath to do the physical offerings, how much labor that is to butcher an animal? That's not what it was about. It was about coming back to God. The whole law was about coming back to God. It was always about discovering God, discovering his love, his justice, his mercy, and his faithfulness. If you don't see that in the love, you've missed it. If you're not giving that to others, you've missed it. So trust is learning to listen and allowing for the growth and the development in the relationship to realize what it's really about. Sometimes there are steps. You teach a child to say thank you. They don't know what thank you means when you start teaching them thank you. Say thank you. And eventually it's thank you, right? They start saying it. Say please, peas. Just get them saying peas. They'll learn one day it's a food, but start them at peas. They'll work it to please, and then they'll figure out what please means. You have to sometimes just start down a path to teach what it's really about. But that's trust. You're teaching trust. God teaches trust and that intimacy with him. The next thing is the pursuit. 
Turn with me to Psalm 84, verse 1. Psalm 84, verse 1. I love Psalm 84. It's one of my favorite chapters. If you're tired of me reading from it, I'm sorry, but we're going back to Psalm 84. It is so beautiful, and it has meant personally so much to me in my life because one of the things that happened through this process is that when you choose God, your road can be lonely. Your road can be lonely. I don't know what it was like for John the Baptist, but it looked lonely. Elijah running away because he thought he was the only one. Lonely. Didn't mean there weren't other believers. Didn't mean there weren't others God was working with. But sometimes it's lonely. But you see in the loneliness, what you're really doing is learning to appreciate you only truly need one. I want you to think about all of us in this room today. What brought us to this place? I can look around and and I'm saying... Before I met you here, I don't see that many people in this room that I knew before. We came because we knew one. The connection that we have is because of a love for God. It was a desire to walk in his ways and be with him, to have an intimacy with him, to say, I trust you. That's what brings us to this place. So I have relationships with a lot of you now, and hopefully growing toward intimacy in many different ways and friendships and, you know, that we we become accountable to each other and we walk together. That all started because of God. You know the one, and he brings his people together. He is the center gathering point for all of us. And it's the most sure foundation and reason to gather that you will ever find because he's eternal and his ways are eternal. And as we meet around Christ... We all will be ushered into one. The beautiful promise of the resurrection of the dead. One of the things I didn't know growing up, but I learned. First Thessalonians 4, that the trumpet would sound, that he would descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. The dead in Christ would rise first. Those who are alive and remain would rise up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we would always be with the Lord. You realize that every time we come together here, what we're really doing is gathering around the Lord. And it brings us together in relationship with each other. Because the intimacy that God wants us to have with him is the intimacy he wants us to learn how to have with others. And just as the intimacy with God required his forgiving of us, so the intimacy we have with each other will require the forgiveness we have with one another. There's no way around it. It requires love. It requires forgiveness. It requires moving on. But what it creates is a hunger for him. Psalm 84, verse 1, Oh, how lovely is your tabernacle. O Yahweh of hosts, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. (laughs) I don't want anything but you. And this is the amazing part about intimacy. When you go through this process of listening to God, believing what you read, trusting in what he says in order to start living by it, you get so hungry. I don't know how you can go through the first three steps without coming to four because there is a hunger to say, I need you. I want to be with you. I got to hear what you say, God. And I'll tell you what, when I first started down this track, it was so hard for me to stop. My daughter was talking about this in in worship uh, today that sometimes it can be difficult to just calm yourself down to listen. Oh, man, I remember. I'm like, I'm going to get up at 5 in the morning. I'm going to go kneel in the, in the room, and I, you know, start praying, and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about the work i got to do that day. I'm already thinking about that. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Stop. Get back. Start praying again. Oh, work this, work that. Oh, stop. What? And it was a, it, there was a literal crucifying of the flesh that had to take place. But you know what? Asking for the crucifixion of the flesh to take place was where I needed to start because what was happening was there was, I was thinking of my own ways. I was thinking of my own past, my own plans, my own patterns, and I wasn't settled. And the beautiful thing, for those of you that are feeling this struggle in your life, and I've talked to multiple people over the last, really about year, about this thing. I can tell you, I can testify to you that as brutal and as ugly and as awkward as it was when I started down this path, I can tell you, it is very easy today. 
Because eventually what happens is that those who seek the Lord will find him. Ask, and it will be given to you, I promise. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. If you want to have intimacy with the Almighty, it's available. But if you think that it comes for every person without the asking, the seeking, and the knocking, that's not the story. For some, intimacy comes because God interrupts your life. He calls out to Samuel when he's a little boy. He said, I want to be intimate with you, Samuel. And he was. Samuel's one of the most beautiful people to read about in the scriptures. But God also gives so many commands that if you would seek the Lord, you would find him. He says, seek the Lord and you will find him. Forsake him and he will forsake you. He'll give you what you want. Do you want him? Don't think that the progress of starting something doesn't require an intentional thought on your part. But also understand this, that the very invitation I'm talking to you about right now is the one that God gives to you. He's calling you to it. Accept the grace, accept his goodness, be inspired by his love for you, that that love would be in you. Do you know who loves much? The one who's received much forgiveness and much love himself. That's what the scripture showed. Do you know what you need to do to see the love of God? Just start looking at him. Just look at him, listen to him. You'll believe and trust, and then a passion will build in your heart but know this, it needs to be there. What would a relationship be if you had to make somebody spend time with you? If you knew that the only reason they're here is because someone else is telling them they had to, or, or they feel that they should, but they don't really want to be here. You know, that comes out every time, right? Right? When somebody doesn't want to really sit down and talk to you in a workplace or in a meal or at a gathering, you kind of know, right? Yeah, you don't have to be God to understand that sometimes you can just tell, they ain't that into me. It's okay. They have other people they want to talk to. They have other people they can connect with. It's okay. It's all right. Where are we with God? When we don't find our hearts pursuing God, we have to go back to these first three points and say, what am I missing here? Because if you've ever really fallen in love with somebody, don't you want to spend time with them? Don't you find it amazing that two people can be living their lives, not spending time together, not knowing each other, and then all of a sudden, boom, they connect. There's attraction. There's connection. They start talking, they're listening, they're believing in one another. They start this relationship of trust, they're growing it together, and all of a sudden they'll tell you six months later, yeah, we're best friends. I only want to spend time with them. We talk every day, every morning, every night. You didn't even know each other six months ago. Yeah, but they started something. They started something that changed what they did, the way they lived. And now they want to be together. Now they want to make a commitment of marriage together because they're like, hey, you're the first person I want to talk to when I wake up in the morning. You're the last person I want to see when I go to bed. And you're the one I want to share my life with. Right? Right? I'm asking, I'm asking the people with the most marriage experience in this whole room right here what it's like. Did you ever not want to be together? You know, that is the thing. that The, the, the time that you spend together... And then all the times where you take a little break from each other, maybe you're off with your own friends, you're doing other things, you come back together, how sweet it is. You don't want to go too long without seeing each other, talking to each other. Well, it's the same thing that happens when you spend time with God and you're intimate with him. So to me, when I realize something's not making me want to, like my heart is not, <gasps> I need you, what is going on? Where is my focus? Because something has gone awry in my thinking. And I'm... Confessing to you, I have that happen in my life at times. To me, it's a big wake-up call. That means scrap the schedule, cancel the meetings, it's time to pursue. Because I never want to be outside of his grace and his presence in knowing confidently I'm walking in his spirit and in his love. I don't ever want to be outside of his presence. The worst thought in my mind is to be walking outside of God's presence at this point. I need him. I need him in every way. And if I don't have intimacy with 
with my creator, what am I? Everything else is just a mess. I don't, I don't care for it. I don't want it. If I can't be there. Now, that doesn't mean that, again, I'm a perfect man, not by any stretch of the imagination. What I'm telling you is I have to keep going back for it over and over, pursuing God. And so with my schedule and the, and the things that I do and, and work that I have and, and responsibilities I have to people, I have to plan. I, have to, I, I book time. I make dates. I say, this is our time. This is our meeting. And as much as it would be a meeting of somebody I have at work, I have to learn to keep the meetings with my Lord the same way because I just need time. And I do that because I want to. I want to make those meetings. I want to make those times. Pursuing God. Notice what he says here in, in Psalm uh, 84, verse 10. <laughs> Somehow my Bible went way far away to one of my other favorite chapters. <laughs> Psalm 84.10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For, the, for Yahweh God is a sun and shield. Yahweh will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Yahweh of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. What a beautiful thing to know that relationship with the Lord and know what it means to spend time together. He loves to spend time with us. In fact, in the book of Malachi, it says that when we are spending time even just talking about him, it says that the Lord listens and he records in a book the things that we say to one another. That's pretty intimate, isn't it? I remember I, I, that, David, you said this. I remember, Scott, when you said this. Do you remember that conversation you had, Linda, where you spoke of me like this? He has a book of remembrance. I love that about God, that he lets us know he is listening to you in your conversations, and he wants us to be intimate with him and be intimate with each other about him. And then lastly, is sacrifice. Turn with me over to Ephesians 5, 25. What is all this really about? Is that when you and I listen to him and start believing in him to come to know him, we start trusting in him and walking with him, and then we start pursuing him and saying, God, what is your will for me? What is it that you want me to do? What is this about? It always comes back to this great mystery between Christ and his church and what this relationship is about. Verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. He gave himself for us that he might sanctify and cleanse, and I'll just put the word in, us that he might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word, that he might present us to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we would be holy and without blemish. Does our husband know about our blemishes? Does our husband know the things that we think? Does the husband know the things that we like, but we dislike? Does the husband know the desires of our heart? And that was the psalm I turned to, because he gives the desires of the heart. Does the husband know? And the answer is, yes, he does. See, that's the thing that you discover in marriage. Intimacy is knowing the whole person. You know the, the wonderful talents. You know the things that you just love. And you learn about the things that you don't so much love. You learn about blemishes. You learn about spots. But the husband who loves his wife learns that all those things are to be washed away. It is a matter of coming to love not in slices but in the whole. 
Human beings, we love to love people in slices. When you're doing what I like, I love you so much, honey. And you're doing what I don't like. <sighs> I won't use the words hate, but strong dislike, which is actually the definition of hate. But the, the thing is, if those are the swings of emotions, one of the, the greatest revelations my wife and I had is that when we have things that we have honest disagreements on and things that we are not happy with each other about, that to think that that should wreck the whole relationship is, is actually kind of a ridiculous, self-serving thought. What's that about? What kind of faithfulness of, is that? You know, what's so amazing is David, King David, was so intimate with the Lord. And then he didn't go out to war when men and kings go to make war. He stayed back, seems like he's bored, looking out the window, sees Bathsheba, lusts after Bathsheba, commits adultery with Bathsheba, gets Bathsheba pregnant, brings home the husband to try to make it look like he got her pregnant. The husband's so honorable, he won't do that. Sends him back to the field, puts him in the front line so he'll die. And then Bathsheba is pregnant and doesn't look like King David did it. And now... uh, Uriah? Oh, man. I'm so old right now with names. Please forgive me. If, if I forget your name, I'm so sorry. I'm just forgetting names left and right. Sends Uriah back out. He's dead. Made it look like it was his. But God knew the whole time. You know why? Because God's intimate with David. You're not hiding anything from this relationship. Even if you don't choose to be intimate with God, he's intimate with you. He knows your comings and your going. He knows the thing you're going to say before you even say it. He knows all who you are. Why fight it? Why not just say, because you're my God. You, you deserve the right to know everything that's going on. You made me. So here is David in this place. Does God just say, that's it, I'm killing you. That's it, you're done. That's it, I'm taking your kingdom from you. That's it, that's it. He sent a prophet with the story of the sheep. He knew that David would judge with judgment and justice, rendering not only according to the law, but according to what was right. And then Nathan said, the man is you. And what did David do? He listened. He reflected. He repented. You can read Psalm 51 on your own later. He didn't stop becoming God's kid because of the horrendous things he did. God knew what he had done. Did he pay a price? Oh, yes. Yes, he paid a big price. It didn't mean that all the consequences went away, but the relationship when he says, and please take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You see, that's for every one of us here. That's the kind of love that we have in God, that God has for us to take us to those places. The sacrifice. Because his desire is to present us without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, to make us, as it says here in verse 27, that we would be holy. (laughs) Don't you love that? The whole point of intimacy is so that we become holy. So husbands ought to love their wives, verse 28, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, just how Jesus loved us. Why would he die? because he loves us like he loves himself. And notice verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. It goes back to Genesis 2. When Adam saw the woman Eve made for the first time, and he looked and said, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, there's no separation between us. We're one. And God says here, verse 31, for this reason a man leaves his father and mother. So important when you join into a marriage that you leave your family to create the new family. It doesn't mean you don't have relationship and love with your other family members. You've got to create your own family. You have to be loyal to each other first. You become one. And that loyalty is found throughout this relationship. Notice, to be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh, verse 32, and this is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Do you see yourself as being one with him? Because I don't think there's a more intimate statement to be made than we are like this. That that Jesus Christ can look at us and say, 
you're bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Do you believe that? See, I, I'm saying the words and you're hearing, but the question is, are you listening, believing, trusting, pursuing, and sacrificing, even sacrificing your own unbelief to say, I am bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. I've accepted the salvation that was in Christ. I was baptized into his death that I might be raised in newness of life, that I would no longer be seen in my sin, but rather in the righteousness that is imputed by faith in Jesus. And now I walk in the spirit, not in the old way, but the spirit overcoming in me that Christ might be in me and that I might know the hope of glory and be found in him who called me to be raised up to an intimacy with him, to not just be alive forever, to be conscious forever, but as Jesus prayed himself on the night in which he was betrayed, that there would be an intimacy of relationship that no one could take away or no one could deny. Turn over, let's just read it in John 17. In John 17, notice what Jesus says. Jesus said in verse 2, you have given him, that is, Father, you've given to me, to Jesus, authority over all flesh that, that, that I should give eternal life to as many as you have given me. And notice what he says, and this is eternal life. This is John 17 and verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Intimacy is the point. Intimacy is the key. Intimacy is what eternal life really is. A knowing, a connection, a depth. Notice in verse 20 of John 17, verse 20. Because Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone. That is those disciples who are alive with him then. He says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Are you a believer? Yes. Are you confident that you are? then notice what Jesus wants. Notice what Jesus prays for you. That they all may be one. One. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That's intimacy. Everything that happens in the intimacy with the Father should be happening in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you gave me, Notice what he says, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Perfect intimacy, perfect oneness, that the very oneness shared between the Father and the Son would be shared with us as well, that we all would be made one together. A perfectly beautiful, intimate relationship. That's why you were made. You were created to have a relationship with God that is so intimate. And really, what is life if there is no intimacy with God? It's just being conscious. It's being the walking dead. But you weren't made for that. You were made to have life and have it more abundantly. Turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 16, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion or the fellowship or sharing of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion, the fellowship, the sharing of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. The reality of what is happening, why we are part of this church, and and coming to know the relationship with Christ that is founded in the relationship of marriage is that we would not only be intimate with him, but that we would be intimate with each other and that we would realize that we are members individually with one head, that is Jesus Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3. 
that we all are joined together in one body, each member doing his share. What brings us together and joins us in one is Jesus and the sacrifice he made. The sharing that we have is in his broken body and in his shed blood that unifies us in one sacrifice that we also might make sacrifices for our Lord and that we would make sacrifices for one another. And so it is a beautiful thing to acknowledge this. Now, what we're going to do right now is we're going to offer communion. And I know that there are those in here that would say, hey, we only want to do this one time of year. And I want you to know I respect that. And there's zero issue with that. I understand how that's arrived at. But I also know that there are others of us that have a conviction that we can gather together and do this. And we want to do this in acknowledging the oneness that we have, the intimacy that we have through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so it says here in 1 Corinthians 11, and, and if you are a believer and disciple, you're walking with him and would like to take communion, it's going to be offered to you today. But here's what I would ask you to do. It says here, verse 18, or excuse me, verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. This is just bread and wine and not the Lord's Supper. If when we are here gathered together, we don't come with the heart for one another in the light of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you look around this room, you're going to see a number of people that Jesus died for. And that is what removes the factions. Because that sacrifice is bigger than than all the things, the obstacles and the barriers that can come in the way. It's what makes us holy. It's his work and his sacrifice that makes us holy. He brings us into this relationship, saving us, to bring us into an intimate walk with him that we might come to know how he is, that we might walk the same way. That is really what we're doing here. And we acknowledge it today as we take of the bread and the wine. He said also this, that he took this and said, this is my body, verse 24, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So as we take this now, I'm going to ask you to take a moment to examine yourself. And I would ask you in this examination to look at where you are before the Lord, where your relationship is and intimacy with him, to identify ways maybe that you can say here today in confession before the Lord how you have sinned, and also specifically look around this room and ask yourself, are you forgiving of the people that you know in this room? Are you appreciating them for who they are in the body of Christ? Are you looking to be serving and kind to one another do you recognize that the reason you are here is because of what Christ did for you so that also he did it for them? And we are all here being joined to one head as one body in the Lord. There is one bread and one cup of blessing that brings us together. And we do proclaim the Lord's death knowing it was his sacrifice for us that brings us in unity together, that brings us to one together. So I'll ask you now just to take a few moments and reflect on that.